Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? I am a licensed clinical social worker. Prior to that, I've worked in community mental health. Do you ever watch people and diagnose them? I was going like, to ask that. I could fucking help that person. Okay. All right, so I've made a list of all my trauma. Yes, let's talk about it. Can you fix me? Uh, if she enters into a relationship where the other person isn't willing to kind of navigate this journey with her, mm. then that relationship isn't worth being in in this moment. Uh. I don't really know how you're supposed to heal. There's a fourth one that they're starting to do some research on called fawning, which is basically like people pleasing love bombing. Don't, let, don't, don't. Those are two. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Tip and Flip podcast. I'm Tiffany Jenkins. That was an interesting intro. I felt really good about it. Yeah, the Tiff and Flip show. Not what did I say? The Tiff and Flip podcast. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm nervous. We have okay. a guest. I know we do. I know we do, and I'm super excited. And I'm Flip Adam. On this podcast, we discuss everything from parenting, addiction, life, even cats wrestling. Sometimes, do you, I wonder, like, do you break it up? Do you just let it happen? I think you got to let it happen. Yeah, sometimes I join in and I just throw a people's elbow Interesting. Um, are you going to tell the people that? So I do this thing when I come over, me and Thelonious have a little inside thing where I turn on her bathroom faucet and he drinks from the faucet and I forgot to turn it off. And two days later, she said, hey, when we were recording, did you turn on the faucet? And I blamed the cat. Yeah, for two days, my faucet was running. So sorry about that. Um before we get into it, we have a very special guest, as you guys see. Yeah. And, and we're going to do that. Um, we got our first piece of fan mail. Yes. And we have to open this because we told him on last week's episode that we would make a trip to the P.O. box and open this. So we discussed whether or not it would be awkward to open it in front of you since we don't have any gifts for you. And, and we, we don't even know what it is. Yes, it would be awkward, but we're going to do it we're, anyway. We're good for an awkward moment. Okay, okay perfect. <laughs> so this is from... This is from... First name. Miss Stephanie. Miss Stephanie. Oh, and there's a note. You know what? I know what it is. I know what it is. I know what it is already. She told me about this. It is a... Hold on. Don't tell me. Read. Read, please. Well... It's an energy drink, but it's uh, neuropathic? Neuropathy? Neuropathic? Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say? And there's such a nice note. I'm a huge fan, but I'll just say, I know you guys were talking about healthy energy options in place of energy drinks. Here are samples of some I use and also sell, but the company is based in Florida and growing like crazy. Anyway, if you got any questions, want to order, um, you can call or text and we got a number. Don't tell my wife. Thank cool, you so thank much. Thank you so much. I'm, just, I'm excited about this. So super special guest, Leanne, who just happens to be a childhood friend of my wife's. Yes. yes. More specifically, you were her base in cheerleading. I was. I saved her life. You did. <laughs> I saved her life. That is so exciting. I'm not trying to brag, but I was the best backspot ever to hold that title, a backspot That's ever. It's an important title. And I feel like we could have really done some amazing things. So Sierra's coming over at the end, and we're going to put up a couple stunts. Oh, God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have that same strength anymore. <laughs> Me neither, girl. I'm out of breath thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but yes, we are excited to have you here because, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Okay. So uh, my name is Leanne. I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I currently work for a local nonprofit. I'm the statewide director of their child welfare programs. Um, so I oversee trauma-informed parenting for foster parents, relatives, and non-relatives who are caring for children in out-of-home care. Um, prior to that, I've worked in hospice, community mental health, um, aging population, kind of the gamut. Okay. All right, so I've made a list of all my trauma. Yes, let's talk about it. Can you fix me? Um, you have to fix yourself, but I can help guide you through the journey. Yes. God, I love that. Oh, God, what a great answer. What I mean, a great answer. I tell all of my clients that I'm not their intervention, mm. that you are your own intervention. What does that mean? So basically it means that you have it within yourself. I might need to help coach you and guide you to the coping skills and strengths that you have, but that it is within you that the change will come. Mm. Very empowering. Yeah. I don't like it. I know. I don't like it either. <laughs> Um, from, from like the other side of the chair, right? From the therapist chair, it's great. But like from a client perspective, cause I've been in that chair too. Um, yeah, it's like, well, that's crap. 
and and like you said, you've worked hospice, but mm-hmm. especially with kids, like you have to, I think, be a special kind of person to deal with that because I would be an absolute train wreck. So I'll, a little bit of journey like through my career. So when I first came out of like undergrad, I had a bachelor's in psychology. I didn't know what I was going to do. I feel like that's kind of like one of those like cop out, like, hey, I'm going to college mm-hmm. and I get a, you know, a degree in psychology. Um, and I applied for this job. It was called a family support worker. Um, and when I got to the job, they're like, oh, but you have all the credentials to be a case manager. And I was like, well, what's that? And they're like, oh, basically you tell parents what they have to do to get their kids back once they lose custody of them like that sounds awful Mm. right like that's not something that I felt at 22 that I was capable of doing but I needed a job right and like we all do and um I was going back to graduate school anyways so I was like all right let's try this and so um that's kind of how I fell into the child welfare work it wasn't really like oh I want to go do this it was basically I was looking for something to fill my time so that I could go to grad school and kind of pay for school um but I fell in love with it because it is, it's hard, but, um, the kids are great. And honestly, like I'm a huge advocate for biological parents who come into the system because I feel like their stories are just as hard as the kids' stories that are coming Mm. in. Right. They've suffered trauma, generational trauma, right. They, they all have their own histories that have kind of led them to the choices that they've made that led to their kids coming into foster care. So there's like a level of empathy that I think that I learned from that position and that job that like I didn't have before. Mm. Would you say that the majority of families that come through your program or whatever um, are, (laughs) I have such a good question (laughs) Um, and it's going to come out so smooth. (laughs) Addiction. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a huge factor in why families come through the system? Especially here in, so DCF does the states by circuit, so this is considered circuit 12, right? So, um, but here locally, yes, um, there was a huge opioid epidemic, obviously. We all are aware of that. <laughs> I was there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm in it. No, yeah. we, we're um, both there. Yeah. We had VIP passes. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. To that show. Yeah. Um, we were, I was actually in a relationship with somebody who also had um, an addiction to opiates. So, oh, wow. Um, at the time that I was um, getting into child welfare. And so I was coaching parents on what they have to do to get their kids back as I had somebody that I was in love with suffering from the same illness. So oh. it was definitely hard. But yes, substance abuse and domestic violence are the two highest removal rates here. Um, locally in our area. And then across the state, substance abuse is just always a problem. Um, so, but yeah, here locally, addiction is huge. Yeah. That's it, a huge reason. I imagine, because I know so many people personally who, like when we were in active addiction, it was nothing to have somebody be like, well, DCF was here again today. Like it's such, it's so heartbreaking. And I imagine as somebody in your position, at times it must feel so you must feel so helpless. Like Mm. there's so much I want to do, but I can't. Yeah. Well, and I think too, as a case manager one and that being 22, like that was naive, right? Like two years old, 22 years old. And I was like sitting across the table from, you know, people who have really hard histories, who have had kids who haven't made the greatest choices for their kids and telling them, Hey, like, It sucks that your kids are in foster care, but here's a list of things that I need you to do. That's terrifying. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, you don't even have kids. And like, how do you understand? Like, you don't live my life. And it took a lot of um, patience um, and a lot of like humility, Mm. like to be able to sit across the table from them be like, you're absolutely right. I don't know anything about that. Like, I've never walked a day in your shoes, Mm. but I want to help you. If you're open to the help, like I can um, and you know, some families I were, I was able to reunify and some, I, I wasn't, and those kids were either adopted or went to relatives permanently. But, um, I think every person has their own journey through addiction and you guys know that, right. And I can't lead them right to sobriety. And so that was a big thing that I had to learn, um, was as much as I wanted to help them, mm-hmm. right? Like there's only so much you can do yeah, yeah. if they're not willing. Um, exactly. Um, But that's all that kind of like, that's their trauma, right? That's a lot of their addiction is because they have unresolved trauma. Mm. Same. Yeah. I'm learning so much about myself. And the interesting thing is because, I mean, my family has a very large history of trauma and mental illness. And so coming into this work and then kind of like sitting on the other side of it and like knowing like my cousins had history with DCF when I was little, like knowing my dad's history, right? My mom's history and kind of like then like being like, I can't believe I like 
who held it together enough where like my family, right, never got into this position. Mm -hmm. There was like somebody holding all the parts together. What do you think the biggest misconception about people in your position who are just there to help is? From a child welfare perspective, I think the the perception is that we're just there to take everybody's kids so that they can be adopted by other families. Right. That's like the biggest thing. I think as like a therapist sitting on a chair with our, you know, client across the couch is like, what are you going to do to fix me? Right. Like, what do you have in your bag of tricks that's going to fix me? Um, and trying to kind of like coach and teach people like that's not my role. Like the knowledge that I got in graduate school and through my licensing process and all that is for me to give to you to go out and for you to do it. Mm. Um, and I think that's also a misconception on that end. It's, I think that people just don't trust enough because there's just been so much broken trust in all the different systems, mental health systems, addiction systems, child welfare systems. People just don't trust. Do you guys find yourself, and, and when I say you guys, people in your position, mm -hmm. clinicians, mm -hmm. um, do you like have people that like you need to talk to ever because i would think like mm. taking on those problems mm -hmm. like and that's your job is to basically take on these problems and and i understand that you have to keep kind of business business mm -hmm. and you know but it, i would feel that in that position that line gets very blurred mm -hmm. There's there's some therapists that do it well and some therapists that don't. And there's some people who get into this line of work and very easily find that it's not for them because they can't take it on. Um, I'll be honest, I was in therapy myself um, after you know coming into this role. Um, it really hit me hard after I had my kid. Mm. That's when I was like, oh wow, like my earth, like the world shattered after I became a parent. And I realized like all the years before that, like the interactions I had with other parents and even maybe like the judgment and like the lack of humility, maybe at sometimes my frustration with them, I'm like all kind of like came flooding in. And then, you know, just being a parent in this world and knowing kind of like the dangers that are out there mm. because I've been working in it, right? Like made me like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> For lack of a better word, right? Like, and so um, I think that yes, one, I think therapists need to be in therapy as well. Um, they need to have that. If they don't have that, then they need to have like a really good supervisor or colleague that they can like talk to or like staff cases with or staff referrals with because it does get hard. Um, I know, you know, my staff here locally just with the work that we do, probably every week we're talking about something hard, right? And something that really affected them. And um, just some of the things that even when we put kids into the foster care system, um, because it's going to protect them, um, sometimes how that fails them too mm. and um how hard it is to be a part of a system that you know knowing that that's going to happen or like kind of like seeing the pieces falling into place where this kid's not going to get permanency or not going to get to go home to mom and dad and like who's going to tell them and how is that going to go oh i i wouldn't know how to shut that off and leave that at the office <sighs> yeah i mean i've been in child welfare for 15 years and in between that I've taken breaks and, and like I said worked in hospice I've done community mental health which is not a break <laughs> yeah by the way I know as somebody who has lots of experience with hospice <laughs> it's one of the most depressing shits you could show up to work to deal so with. the reason why I say take a break is because when I was in graduate school like the aging population was where I wanted to work like that was like my wheelhouse. I never once thought that I would be like dealing with trauma and kids and families and family dynamics. Like I just wanted to do death and dying. Why? Let's talk about that for a okay, second. Yeah, Let's absolutely. just pause there. Pause there. So um, one, my dad passed away when I was 13 mm. um, from a heart attack. So I never got to kind of like know that goodbye process. Mm. And so I was always, I think, curious about what that looks like when you can have it. Mm. Um, Two, my grandparents were kind of like, like the ones that were holding it together. Like from my perspective now as a kid, like I didn't see it, but my perspective now, like we're the ones that are holding it together and they are both on hospice mm -hmm. um, when they passed away. And so I just, that experience to me kind of he was healing, even though it was hard Okay. because I didn't get to experience it when my dad died. And so um, going into, gra I was actually in graduate school when my grandmother passed away. So she was on hospice then. And um, I ended up interning at that hospice after, and then I ended up working there for some time. And I, mm. um, and I loved, I mean, I loved it. The only reason why I left that position um, was because we moved to Orlando for a little bit. Mm. Um, otherwise I'd probably be working there still to today. I was gonna say, would you go back if there Yeah, was I mean, I would love it. Um, just because it's just, to me that it's, you're helping people with the final journey of their life and you're helping 
families kind of understand and how to make that journey um, as beautiful as possible. Mm. Um, and so to me, that was very special compared to child welfare, which again, I love, but it's a, it's a lot harder and the, you don't have a lot of control Mm-hmm. Um, because there's so many people involved in that system um, and the kids therapists and the guardian ad litems and the case managers and the attorneys and the bio parents and the foster parents like there's so many people and so many parties at play that sometimes you just don't feel like you have any control there yeah um, so it's harder to navigate um, but I don't know I just always loved hospice and I think that dying yeah it's so cool it takes hey. a very special person to do that in my opinion because I know for a fact if I was working in hospice, I would just make it so awkward with ill-timed jokes. Oh like God, I just the worst. I know myself, <laughs> and I'd be like, "Man, it's everybody's dead in here. What's yeah. going on? Like, where's why is the vibe so? Like, I wouldn't know how to conduct myself properly. I just I'm so inappropriate, and even at funerals, or if everybody's sad, I feel like it's my job to like break up the sadness with humor. Mm-hmm. It's a stupid thing that I can't stop doing. But that's what I would do as a hospice person. I'd show up in a clown suit and just be so dumb. I have a question. Dealing with um, hospice people, is there one common regret or like a a regret that popped up more than once that you could think of in dealing with somebody? Um, Not like the same thing, but I think sometimes what happens is like they might have like a falling out with a family member or a friend or something that they never like mended. Mm. And so that tends to be sometimes when we're doing like um, the grief work with them um, as they decline, um, if they're open to that, obviously, um, that tends to come up sometimes. I think a lot of it is more of the worry of what are we going to like? did I do everything that I could for my family while I was here? Like, are all my affairs in order? Like, and all of that stuff. And sometimes it's like, it doesn't even matter if it is right. Um, because that's not what's important right now. Right. The important thing is spending time with your family and, um, kind of whatever you can do with the, if it's limited physical capacities or even, you know, cognitive capacities, like what can you do right to make this time, um, special, um, cause you don't want to really waste it worrying about like the paperwork and stuff. So that's why I'm like a big proponent of like, it doesn't matter how young you are, like make sure you have all of your paperwork in order. Mm. That's so shitty. It is. To cause me. I don't have it. I don't either. And I was just thinking about it today. <laughs> I know. I practice, I preach it, but I don't, I don't that's have it. That's so funny. Wow. It's just a lot. Um, the only thing I really have to give is debt. So it's fine. <laughs> yeah. You can have it. <laughs> Because, I mean, there's all kinds of different forms of trauma, right? So you don't have to be just, like, a trauma therapist. Trauma is, in everybody's life, it doesn't matter what avenue you're working in as, like, a social worker, you're going to run into somebody who has had some form of trauma in their Mm -hmm. life. And so I think that having an understanding of that and, like, just, like, human beings are messy and Mm -hmm. their stories are going to be messy. You're never going to have somebody come to you when you're a social worker in a pretty little package with a bow on it. Right. There's just no such thing. I, so when, before we were starting, Mm -hmm. you were talking about how you had seen our last episode about attachment theory and you have like a certification. Yeah. So part of my current role, um, is, uh, to teach trust-based relational intervention. So it's a modality, um, from Texas Christian university, Karen Purvis Institute of uh, child development. Yeah, no. All shout, the out, shout out TCU shout horned out. frogs. Yeah. Cha, cha, cha. The horned cha, cha, cha. frogs. The, yeah, I know. Isn't that, that's a little, mm-hmm. that's an interesting. The horned frogs. That's their mascot. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Why do you know that? Ladanian Tomlinson. That's why I know that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, oh, you said a lot of words. <laughs> so I didn't understand. Yeah, any you said modalities. And you said so trauma, trust, 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 trust modalities, trust and modalities. Just trust, everybody. That's the episode okay. ending. <laughs> um, trust-based relational intervention. So basically, what the the theory, the thought, the modality is, is it's a parenting model to understand how to connect with your kids. Um, Primarily it was developed for kids who had been adopted, but it's kind of like branched out to really just parenting. Um, How do we make sure that we are completing the attachment cycle with our children who have had disrupted attachment cycles earlier on in life? And I think when you kind of branch it out to other parenting, just general parenting is like, how do we ensure that we're staying mindful and attuned right? To know like when we don't 
make the mark with our kids, right? Or we mm. miss that mark that we know how to go back and kind of correct, correct that from like attachment theory um, so that we do have the securest attachment with our kids that we can form. Right. I need that. Yeah. I need that. I, can, with your kids? Can you? Can you yeah, I need Can it I too. buy that online can somewhere? Can come to my house and do it? Because it's easier to teach it than it is to actually mm. practice oh, it. God. How many kids do you have? I only have one. How old? She's going to be seven in July. Aww. Funny story. Uh, Sierra told me that our daughters were in dance together. Really? Yeah. The little purple jumpsuit. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had no idea. That's so crazy. Mm -hmm. So they were on the same like team and everything? Yeah. A whole season together. Really? Yeah. I wonder That's if they fun. know each other. I don't know. Maybe. They might recognize each other. That's so funny. I'm sorry, my cat. Did I bring catnip today? I know. I feel like something's going on. This cat he's, is... He's trying to show off because we have a guest. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Every time we have a guest, they just get extra crazy. Hey, buddy. So I had an epiphany. Okay, about your attachment style. About my attachment style, yes. I realized... Because when we were talking about it, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm crazy attachment. I'm yeah, obsessive. Yeah, I'm obs like, whatever. I just, I get very attached and I'm like so attached, like a barnacle, like you can't get me off of there, like whatever. But then I realized while driving, I think that if I'm receiving adequate attention and affection that I won't be so anxious and crazy. I feel like I'd be secure if I was securely being secured. The whole time that I was listening to your guys' podcast, I was like screaming four things in my head. So when we teach trust-based relational intervention, we talk about attachment theory a lot. We talk about childhood attachment and how that forms, but then we also talk about how that translates into adulthood because it's important to understand your attachment style when you become a parent, right? Yeah. Because it does impact your ability and how you provide care to your kids. Um, it can either make you an authoritative parent, authoritarian, permissive, neglectful, right? Based on because the whole... Permissive. Mm. Authoritative. Authoritarian. Yep, that too. That one too. Ta, 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 ta. Yeah, those two always get interchanged. But so there's we teach it from a perspective that there's four characteristics of secure attachment. And if you can do those four things in a relationship with somebody, then you can be securely attached with that person. But you have to be kind of like mindful and attuned. Wait, you have to do all four things? Yeah, there's four characteristics. Yeah. We haven't heard them yet. No, I understand, but mm -hmm. she's talking about four things. You have to do all four? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Is that okay. too many things? For it you? Is That's a lot, things. Things. a lot of things. Okay, what are the four things? So the first one is the ability to give care. Easy. Check. Okay. The ability to receive care. Mm -hmm. In an authentic way. Okay. Okay. The ability to be autonomous. What so does that mean? The ability to kind of like be able to be yourself in whatever setting that you're in that you are comfortable and authentic. Yep, you don't have yourself. that one. No, I don't have that. Nope, you're dead. Um, and then your ability to negotiate your needs. Mm. I get real passive aggressive when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in any of yeah, the relationships do. that you guys have, if you're practicing those four characteristics, then you're practicing secure attachment. But if at any point, one of those characteristics kind of start to fall to the wayside or we're not being mindful or working on them, then we kind of fall into characteristics of other attachment styles. Mm. And that's just us being on autopilot. Like we're just, when you're not mindful, you're not aware, you're not attuned, when you're letting stress and emotion kind of take over, right? Then I call it autopilot. So let me ask you a question. And I don't even know if this is going to be like, if this is going to make sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like I do three of those things really well. The communicating my needs. Mm -hmm. I don't like, I will kind of put them to the side, right? Kind of look at the bigger picture, mm -hmm. put it to the side. And then when it gets to like a, a point where I feel like it needs to get addressed, I'll do, say some passive aggressive things mm -hmm. um, until the point where like I reach my breaking point and then it's a serious conversation it's not an argument but it's a serious conversation um, would that be and obviously these are a result of attachment styles as a kid mm -hmm. yeah so I need to look at the relationships with my parents to realize why maybe that is? Does that make sense? Yeah, so kind of going back to your point of like when I took that training to become a practitioner for that, I had to do an AAI, which is an adult attachment inventory. 
And so they basically ask you like very pointed questions about your relationship with your mom and your dad. And they, it's more of like a linguistics thing. It's about how you talk about the relationship. It's how they determine your attachment style. Oh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so since my dad had passed away at 13, I had done a lot of work from the 20 years until I became, you know, a TBRI practitioner um, to kind of understand my relationship with him, kind of understand the death and, and you know, be okay with it. Um, whereas with my mom... I wasn't so securely attached. So I had more of um, an anxious, ambivalent attachment style. So going into adulthood, that would be perceived as kind of like that preoccupied, entangled attachment style, just by the way that I talked about my relationship with her. But everywhere else, I had what they called earned secure. So I had done the work in those relationships to understand, um, but I hadn't done a lot of the work with the relationship with my mom. And so knowing that, when I got the, you know, um, certification a few years ago I've been more mindful and aware of like how I interact with her and like our conversations and trying to be more mindful of like the way that I'm responding to her because I'm being sometimes passive aggressive um, I might be too judgy too judgmental right because I felt that in my relationship with her as a child mm. so like I have my relationship with my mom I had a relationship with my biological father that stopped probably five years ago and then my stepdad came into my life when I was like five years old. So technically, I would look at all three of those relationships. Yeah, it really is just who was your primary caregiver in those formative years. And typically, that's under the age of 12. I'm screwed. I was. No, you're not. I was a wild child. I, I think I'm screwed. Like, I don't even remember my parents. Like, I remember them, but I have so many questions that I can never get the answers to. And that sucks. I think I do too. Um, when I try to think back on certain experiences and certain things, like there's like a certain cutoff point like that I can't remember or I'm not allowing myself to remember. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why with the attachment styles, like you can, they're fluid. They're not fixed. So like just because like. Thank goodness. Yeah. And like you can have characteristics of multiple ones. It's just which one do you have the characteristics most of? And that's tend to like where you're going to be categorized. But that kind of like veil in your memory, it, they say that's a dismissive attachment style mm. kind of like trait so that like you can be like, oh no, I was, you know, loved or I, because you don't remember. Right. right? It's, it's more of like the the um the instrumental care that maybe your parents gave you like there was a roof over my head i had food in the refrigerator like you remember that stuff but like that nurturing care you might not remember because either one it didn't happen or when it did happen it was so inconsistent that it kind of was like is this actually honest true authentic nurturing that you're giving me mm, that's real so if the mind is such a powerful thing that it can do stuff like that right mm -hmm. um because i think that our minds are tend to kind of try to protect us from certain like negative feelings and stuff like that how as somebody in your position a clinician like how do you work through that with somebody who it's not that they're not sharing with you. They honestly don't remember. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a few different modalities that some therapists engage in. Hypnotherapy has been popular since back in the day, right? Stop smoking, mm -hmm. you know, resolve childhood memories. But there's also some problems with that technique. A new one that is kind of popular now is EMDR. EMDR. I knew you were going to say it. Yeah. So um, it's definitely something that um, a lot of people are utilizing because it activates um, the, the rapid eye movement, activates parts of your brain to help you reprocess the memory. Dang. And so um, I never say it right, but I'm going to try. It's bilateral stimulation of the brain. So it's like you, like by moving it, right, they're making you do that. Um, it's allowing you to activate parts of your brain at the same time that typically wouldn't be activated at the same time so that you can reprocess those memories. Couldn't you really jack yourself up? Like if you like, what if you like uncovered some like, mm. well, messed up stuff? I think that would be important for that particular person's healing journey. It would. I would also question the validity of it. I don't trust my own thoughts and memories. Hmm. I think a therapist isn't going to be able to tell you that your thoughts and memories are correct or incorrect. Right. Right. I think it's the perception of your own world and the perception of your own experience. And so based on what it is that you're thinking or feeling, what can we do with that? Right. right? Because it's still your perception. You're going to have to walk out into the world and whether you trust your own thoughts and memories that 
is work that like you would have to come to like with your therapist right to kind of like understand that about like what do I find actually true like when I'm stacking it up against like the the what's the word that I'm looking for um the timeline of my life Mm -hmm. like does any of this seem accurate Mm. right and if it doesn't then it's like okay then maybe that isn't how that played out maybe that's not true maybe that never happened right I don't but you won't know that until you kind of start to kind of like line that out right yeah that makes sense and it also makes sense that it's like whether or not it happened if you're perceiving it as something that happened yeah that's what needs to be explored not whether or not it actually did it, exactly it's like people with like Alzheimer's and dementia right like mm. talking her language now hold on she she <laughs> Go on. So, like, if you try to tell them that that baby doll isn't their daughter, they're going to, like, they're not going to understand. They're not, they're going to get angry, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's in their perception, right? In their mind, in that moment, that is their child. Same thing with somebody who's in psychosis or delirium, right? If you try to tell them, like... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Well, no, like, but if you try to tell them, like, I remember this uh, very specific moment. My grandmother was in the hospital. She had a raging... UTI um, and in older adults that can change your cognitive abilities and so she was um, at the hospital and it said NCH because we're we're from Naples so Naples Community Hospital and she's originally from North Carolina so she kept saying I'm at North Carolina Hospital Uh. I'm in high school at this point so I'm naive I'm like no you're at Naples Community I kept trying to like you know challenge her challenge her challenge her on her perception of her reality in that moment she slapped me across the face. Oh my gosh, grandma. Yeah, grandma was wild um, when she had a UTI. <laughs> um, so, but once she like, they gave her the antibiotics and she was clear, she could tell you where she was and what she was doing. But again, like that had something to do with the viral infection that was happening. But again, that was her perception. That was her reality. And I was trying to challenge it so much that mm. she just got aggressive. That's my problem. So I challenge, mm-hmm. I challenge. Like a lot of times, like we have conversations mm-hmm. and I tend to do that. Like, I want to challenge people's, Mm -hmm. you know, I guess perception or the way that they're processing things. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's probably not the best thing to do. I mean, therapy is challenging people's perceptions in a way, right? Like, when I'm working with somebody, I am trying to get them to maybe reframe some of their thoughts, right? If they don't believe themselves or if they believe, like, they're the most horrible person in the world and nobody's ever going to love them, obviously I want to challenge that thought and I want to reframe it for them. But when we're talking about like trauma and somebody's experience of the world or experience that led to this like trauma response within them, it's really hard to do that. And it really does take kind of like specialized training and understanding of like, how far do you push this person until it's time to take a break? And then start then the next session, right? Push. You're never going to get it all done in one session. I think from a loved one trying to work with somebody who might have a trauma history, it's also understanding that in certain moments, they're going to be great. And in other moments, they're not. And in those moments when they're not is understanding that they're living in that moment where something happened to them, right? Their body, their brain, everything is responding to that experience. And we just have to like kind of hold space for them at that moment and not challenge it. And then when they come back to us, right, that's when we have that conversation of like, that was a really hard moment. You were super triggered. I'm really sorry. Right. Um, It was the episode. The episode that we watched back. The one that I made you cry. Do you remember? You had that. Yeah, you had that. Response. About. That was yeah, crazy. That's what I was just thinking. So about. interesting. We had an episode where we like just weren't seeing things eye to eye, and I felt attacked, even though I wasn't being mm-hmm. attacked. I perceived it that way. And he was challenging me, and I wasn't in the fucking mood to be challenged. And so I got very defensive, and it was very wild to watch it back because it changed me forever it made me realize that i am a person who gets defensive Mm -hmm. and i see um what's the word i'm looking for like when someone i guess i see people challenging me even if they're not Mm -hmm. and so i automatically go on the defense Mm -hmm. and it just like i've learned so much through doing doing this podcast and it's always those really uncomfortable moments that I come out the other side and I'm like, oh, I need to work on that. One of the hardest things for me to understand about mental health clinicians, right, is like if I have the flu, Mm -hmm. I can go to a doctor and they can do a flu test and they can test and say, okay, I have flu and there's a specific protocol, right, antibiotics, blah, blah, blah. But mental health, it obviously comes down to schooling and it's not like you guys have minimal schooling. Like it's, it's, Mm -hmm. I'm sure, in depth. But it is truly 
kind of, uh, it can vary from person to person, mm -hmm. right? And, and like when you were saying like w how far to push somebody and like when to know to come off, but somebody's, a clinician's, like you might know when your cutoff is, but it might be different if I was a clinician. Mm -hmm. It might be different if she was a clinician. So like what, I don't even know if I'm trying to ask a question, but. He, he can't comprehend how someone can be fixed by coming in and like what that timeline is and how do you know when, because if you're sick and you go to the doctor, mm -hmm. they give you a prescription of something mm -hmm. and then you're healed. But with mental health, it's so different. There is no finish line. There is no set cure. So how do you know? Is that what you were? Because that's what you said the other week. That's what you were. I mean, that, yes, yes, that, so that wasn't what necessarily what i was saying but that ties okay in well perfectly. what were you saying i don't know you have to I, my mind is so blown right now don't let me speak for you no but like that, was a, that was a trolling wife because i w what he means is <laughs> i will know because i listen. i really wasn't there was no question attached to my thing it was more of just like a statement but then you tied in that question and it actually works perfectly because we've talked about you wondering that before yes absolutely i can't remember when yeah so my thought is that you're looking at mental health through a medical model and it's not <sighs> mm. So would you look at addiction from a medical model? Interesting. What do you mean? Like, cause is, kind of, is there a cure? There's not a cure. So you don't go to the doctor, you don't get a test. They don't give you a prescription and then you're all better. Well, that's true, but there is programs mm -hmm. and there's programs for mental health, mm. right? So you just have to figure out what works best for that person's particular need. And just like addiction isn't cookie cutter from each person, neither is mental health. So just because I might have major depressive disorder and you might have major depressive disorder, the modality that I use versus what you use might be different too. So you might be doing, you know, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Like with your therapist and I might be doing narrative therapy. Mm -hmm. So like it really is kind of from the therapist perspective, and I don't want to like demean therapists, I don't want to demean myself. It really is kind of like, as you get to know the person and you're building rapport, you can then identify what they're gonna buy into, mm. what modality is gonna work, right, best for them on where they are in their own journey. Same thing with addiction, right? Like there is a pretty standard like treatment program, right? And they typically all run the same models and they use motivational interviewing a lot of the time, um, but not everybody's journey is the same. Right. And so somebody coming into rehab might be in a very different place their third time than their seventh time. Yeah. Right. And same thing with somebody who's in therapy. They might go to therapy multiple times and it just doesn't work. And they finally find that therapist and that modality that clicks. Hmm. That makes sense. Do you ever watch people? Yeah. And diagnose them? I was going like, to ask that. I could fucking help that person. Like, I know the answer. Do you analyze everybody? I try not to. Um, it's got to be hard to shut that off. Yeah. I just, I think... For me, because I've been told by friends and family that I've done it mm -hmm. or that they feel like sometimes when I'm having conversations with them, instead of just being a listening ear, I'm being a therapist and that's Ooh. not what they need. Um, that I've, this is kind of like different, like autopilot versus being mindful and attuned. Like when I go into those situations, what does this family member need for me? What does, you know, my mom need today? What does my friend need? What does my sister need? Um, versus like, when I go to work, what people need. Um, so it is, it is hard. It takes practice, but yeah, I mean, go, I don't like to go out to restaurants. I don't like to see like families interacting together. I'm a huge like Disney person, but even going to Disney sometimes triggers me. Cause like people are Ugh. peopling at Disney and it is yeah. not the happiest place on earth. <laughs> no. Um, so I tend to like just stay in my own lane with my blinders on, but yeah, I mean, it was a struggle. And I think even more so working in child welfare and like seeing certain ways that parents interact. Like I remember being a server at a restaurant um, back home and hearing somebody spanking their kid from the bathroom. Mm. And it, like one, it broke my heart. Cause I mean, it was, if I can hear it coming from the bathroom, it was yeah. a pretty, you know, traumatic event. And two, it's like, Oh, I just want to go in there and tell them that that's a coercive tactic. And yeah, you might be stopping the behavior in the moment, but you're not teaching your child that replacement behavior for them to do the right thing the next time. Mm. And it's like, Ugh. and so those moments, you know, but it's, you kind of got to know, like, you can't save everyone. You can't be a part of everything. And you got to kind of know your lane. I think it's safe to say that, like, there's no, at least up until this point, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. there is no, like, set parenting 
course that works because kids are all different, right? Because mm-hmm. I can, I can look at like, I got my butt whooped, mm-hmm. right? But also, I was a raging addict who got arrested at the age of thirteen, and you know what I mean. And I can't necessarily tie that to getting my my butt whooped, mm-hmm. but I can also look at the other side where. And like, this is what I struggle with as a parent is trying to find out which method, mm-hmm. right, works for kids. And like, I don't spank my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But it, it's nothing that like, it doesn't work. <laughs> at least, at least not. And I end up feeling worse than they do. Yeah. Um, but I also don't. I feel like I'm doing a disservice because I'm like trying to figure out like with my son currently, the only thing that seems to be working is bribery and that I feel like that's not a good parenting (laughs) tactic. So I would say flip the verbiage and say you're doing incentive parenting. Mm. So you're providing an incentive to motivate the behavior change and to create behavior momentum for him to do the right thing. But you have to kind of taper back the incentives as he starts to do the right thing more and more. Oh, dang. I think as parents, we second guess ourselves all the time. And you're right. There is no one right way to parent. And honestly, like I teach parenting classes and I teach people how to do it. And I go home and I'm like, I look at my husband in the eyes and I'm like, "I, I don't know. I have no idea what to do now. And he's like, all right, I'm tapping in. He knows like when I'm asking him to tap in, like I've, I've run out of all my skill and, um, it's still just not working. And I think that's okay though. Like that's okay for me not to be a perfect parent because then I would be setting up an expectation Mm -hmm. for other people that perfection is the goal. And it's not what the goal is, is connection and making sure that your child feels safe, seen, heard, and valued. And if you can do those things, even though if we might mess up from time to time, right, that rupture in our relationship, if we can come back and do that repair, then you're getting it right. I think, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sure you got questions. I apologize. So like I'm having troubles connecting with my son right and like I look at my daughter she just turned five you know she's a little princess and she's quiet and shy and she's you know likes to lounge and likes to relax and um always says please and like just very like she'll ask me hey can I have a piece of chocolate and I'm like no and she's like okay and walks away right and then my son is the polar opposite Mm -hmm. Where I'm like, hey, don't jump off the couch. And he's like, okay. And then gets on the table and jumps onto the couch. And like it gets to the point where I know that connection is important. And I want him to feel loved and secured. But there's times when like I am at my wit's end Mm -hmm. where I love him. I do anything for him. I don't really care for him too much right now. Mm -hmm. And so like, how do you navigate, like navigate that? I think that's an honest way of parenting. Sometimes we don't like our kids, Mm. right? It's it's hard, right? Because they're like these little people who are challenging us every single day. Like my daughter will correct me. I'm like at 730. She's like, actually at 732. (sighs) <laughs> right right it just, like it's like hearing nails on a chalkboard when she does that and she like it's like she knows it now so she does it because I've told her I'm like hey like when you challenge me or when you try to correct me that really like it really does bug me and it makes me very upset and that's a me thing right it has nothing but that is a me thing um but she still does it right and so in those moments I'm like I don't like you right now <laughs> but that's okay I think what It's how do we respond? Like we can think in our head, I don't like this right now. Like they, or we tap out or we don't say anything until we're calm and then we can come back with a rational thought. So like when she does that to me, like I will, it takes everything out of me. I will, you know, ball my fist. I'll grit my teeth. I'll do whatever it is until like I come to the point where I'm like, I've told you, right. That that really is one of like my things that really bothers me and it has nothing to do with you. It's not like you're a kid has everything to do with me, but I, I'm going to ask you not to do that. Right. And it's setting that expectation Mm -hmm. for her. Like, Hey, like, and so same thing, like with your son, like the jumping off the table, I would just be like, Hey, these are your two options right now. You can either go do this or you can go do this, but what you're doing right now is not an option. Right. And so I would give him controlled choices. 
Like how, how do you allow him to engage in that behavior? Cause it seems like he needs some sort of physical stimulation, maybe some sort of sensory input. Yes. Like, yeah. He does. How do you give him that in a controlled, safe choice? So you can give him two choices. And then he's like, I don't want to do either one of those. Okay, cool. You want to make a compromise? You want to make a deal? Let's figure that out. What do you think is best? But I'm still the parent. I get the final say and be like, oh, you know, that compromise isn't going to work out, but maybe we can do this. Right. So you still have the control. You're still the boss. It's still like no nonsense. He's not going to get his way, but you're giving him controlled choices to be able to kind of meet his own sensory need or to feel seen, to feel heard. Just telling a kid not to do something get, doesn't give them the replacement behavior. So they only know what not to do. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. So I do have a spare bedroom. So <laughs> I can text my wife if you want to move Slumber in. Slumber party. Sorry. Do you have your friends hitting you up all the time? I feel like I would if we were friends. I'd be like, hey, girl, hope you're well. <laughs> Quick question. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, no, which is, again, I think it goes back to that, like, they want a friend, not a not a therapist. Um, or, or they okay. just know you so well before therapy. They're like, we're not asking her shit. She's the craziest one out of well, all of us. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's that, too. They all have known me since, you know, before I became who I am today. <laughs> um, I also think it probably they may not. Because uh, fear of judgment, mm -hmm. possibly. Yeah. Right? Well, and I think I actually had an honest conversation with one of my friends recently um, where she basically said, like, I feel like when I tell you about some of my problems, you treat me like I'm a case. And so it really made me kind of like have to look at like perspective, like, mm. oh, like, am I giving advice from my social work hat or am I giving advice from like my friend? Like, you know, I want the professional one well, <laughs> that you got a degree in. Yeah. That's the she, advice she I want. She doesn't want that one. That's so interesting she, to me. She wants the one that agrees with her. That's, <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. She wants someone to co-sign. Yeah, bullshit. which is totally fine. And that's what friends do. We co-sign to the bullshit, right? That's but, funny. Yeah. yeah. But the therapist doesn't, right? And so me right. thinking I'm, you know, giving her pragmatic thoughts and ideas and tools, right, um, isn't really what she was looking for. Right. She just wanted someone to listen. I'm working on it. I get it. <laughs> I'm working it. on it. You yeah. are working on it. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. He asks it's hard. now, do you want solutions or mm. do you want a bit? Yes. Uh, that's, it's that's tough. That's a very good question. It's it's tough. It I, I I really like it. People's thought processes and behaviors and actions like intrigue me so much, but I have such a fear of... Like, I feel like everybody would turn into the matrix and like, I would just be analyzing everybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I do and that I, and I, I don't feel, have a degree. I feel like it would be exhausting. I think once like you are working in it, you find yourself in opportunities where you don't have to do it. Like, like when it becomes like work, mm. like you really do try to check out of that in that your personal sense. space. Um, you're off the clock. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. Like, I watch The Real Housewives, and I'm like, yo. <laughs> like, or, like, Teen Mom or anything like that. I'm like, okay. Yeah, true. Um, but, and my husband's always like, why are you watching? It's like, you you leave work, and you come back, and you're working, because, like, That's you watch so these funny. shows. But I'm like, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I, I think we just, it's just a mindful thing that I have to do to turn it off when I do get home or when I'm with friends or when I'm with family, mm -hmm. so that it doesn't turn that way. So that things can be enjoyable. And like, I can actually live my life because if I'm always constantly trying to be like, well, this person's that way and this person's that way. Again, I think it kind of goes back to like the mindset of like the medical model versus like humans are just messy. Mm. Right. And so the DSM was basically created as a way to give a medical framework to mental health problems to be able to like bill insurances. Right. And so mm. and what's DSM stand for? Diagnostic and statistical manual. Okay. And so basically it's where all of the mental health disorders sit and it basically has all the criteria on how, like if a person has all these indicators, this is their diagnosis. And I'm not, I mean, it's a framework that we have to use for therapy. You have to have a diagnostic code in order to bill for therapies. Um, but it was created primarily for that, that purpose. Hmm. And I think to also keep like some fidelity in the model of diagnostics. I don't know. You just said um, fidelity. It's a bank. Fidelity is when you're Life faithful in your too. marriage. Yep. yep. Yeah. It, basically to make sure that like every therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist, right, is looking at the same framework to be able to say that that's the diagnosis for that person or that person does have this disorder. That's very cool. So when you watch the Tiff and Flip show, mm -hmm. what's wrong with us? Nothing. Good answer. Yeah. That's you guys a are great. great. Answer. Fantastic. What's wrong with Flip? Let's just be real. There's a lot... <laughs> 
and now's the time to unpack now's it. Now's the time to unpack it. How do it. we fix him? No, I'm just kidding. He's great. Everybody thinks that I'm the one. Everybody's like, oh my God, Philip's so wise and he's so smart and Tiffany's so lucky to have such a great friend because he just is so great at everything. Tiffany is really fucked up. <laughs> they needs never help. once needs have Jesus. said that. Yeah. They've always said that. They don't say you need Jesus. <laughs> All right, let me ask you yeah. a more specific question. We're not going to bring religion into it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even hear it. Oh, okay. Uh, did, am I the one who brought it up? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even hear it. I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, my mind is racing because I would, my question is, do you think that it is possible to be successful in a relationship if you're really fucked up in the head? Yes. Really? Yeah. Are you doing the work to try to unfuck your brain? Yeah. Okay. Then yeah, you can be successful uh, in a relationship. Are you? I'm sorry. Am I supposed to say that? Like I'm F-word. surprised. I thought I thought you were going to say, no, you have to heal first before. You- so I think that, so here's the thing. I told you guys that I was in a relationship previously with somebody who had a substance abuse issue. Mm-hmm. Um, it ended before he got sober, right? And so I went into the relationship now that I'm married um, right after that, like a few months after. And I had to do a lot of healing. Mm-hmm while building that relationship and it wasn't easy it wasn't easy for him because there was a lot of trust and betrayal issues yeah right from being in a relationship with somebody who had an active addiction 100 that i put onto him which was not fair to him um but it took the right person right to kind of call me on my shit mm-hmm. and be like hey like this isn't about me right like, this is about you and your experiences. And, like, I'm going to support you because I love you. But, like, this isn't about me. And so it really wasn't until, like I said, after my daughter that I, like, I really had to change the narrative of how we were going to interact in our marriage to make it work. Right? Mm. And so he does work on his own. Right? He knows from my journey and What do you mean he does work on his own? So he doesn't go to therapy. Okay. He's... Love you, but you don't. And I'm sure he'll watch. Yeah. That, so. Sorry, honey. Um, but I think because I've done the work on myself and I've told him I've negotiated my needs. Mm. And so he knows what I'm asking for and he knows that I need those needs met. And yeah. so it's not him saying, okay, that's great. And dismissing them. Huh. Right. It's yeah. him being like, okay, I recognize that and I'm going to do better. Um, and so I think even though he may have not for all of his junk and stuff from his past that he might have, or even though he didn't actively go to therapy, I think that by me going to therapy and kind of realizing certain things and talking to him about it made him think about things differently. And we have a lot more open communication now Mm -hmm. because of that. And the way that I was trying to communicate with him before was like, I would just like word vomit on him. Like, I mean, I would send like texts. What? That's crazy. Yeah. So crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Like pages. And like, like it was just, yeah, it was awful. Um, like the, looking back at it i'm like wow i was so like entangled like yeah like like, so codependent when sierra and i got together Mm -hmm. right she had uh trauma issues she was dealing with i was newly clean and sober and trying to figure out how to navigate my life but one thing that i think we both did in the beginning was set boundaries Mm -hmm. and kind of stuck with them. Mm -hmm. And there were definitely mistakes that were made, but because you had two willing participants that were willing to not only communicate, but kind of show through actions Mm -hmm. that, um, like it's easier to navigate that as opposed to, and let's just, you know, let's just say we have like a friend, Beth, Mm -hmm. right? And Beth is, has a broken picker. Mm. She tends to pick guys that are emotionally unavailable. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of kind. It, it's kind of hard to be if you are messed up mm-hmm. to get into a relationship with somebody who is emotionally unavailable or not willing mm-hmm. to kind of put in the work and show you through actions. Yes. Does that make sense? No, you're, that's right. So like Beth, if she enters into a relationship where the other person isn't willing to kind of navigate this journey with her, Mm. then that relationship isn't worth being in in this moment. Uh. It's more important for her to do the work herself, right, to understand, like, her needs, right? But if she's in a relationship with somebody who's willing to do the work alongside of her, right, boundaries, expectations, 
showing up through action, right? Then that can be a relationship that can flourish as she's working on herself simultaneously. Get your shit together, Beth. Yeah. Beth. Fucking Beth sounds like a bitch. <laughs> Interesting. That's such great advice. Dang. That's really good advice. <laughs> We don't know who Beth is, do we? Nope. <laughs> okay. I don't know, but I feel like Beth would disagree if she was here about the picker thing. But um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyways, I um, I'm mentally unstable, and I have a couple of really close friends who I. This is a side note, unrelated to what we were just talking about. But back to me, because <laughs> we weren't on me a second ago. No. We were on somebody else. Uh-huh. Yeah. This is back to me. Um, I think I don't really know how you're supposed to heal Mm. other than just giving it time. Like to me, I feel like I could be single forever and never heal. And I could go to therapy and just get honest and never heal. I feel like there's shit I'm supposed to be doing. Let's say there's a traumatic divorce. Mm -hmm. What help? (laughs) Well, I would, I would, what are some, what should I be doing? How do I, out of curiosity, right? Like something like that. And this is just where my mind goes, right? Let's say I have like a weird phobia of foods. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to get through that unless I am dealing with foods, like in trying foods and stuff like that. So I, I don't know how you could necessarily heal in a relationship. I'm right, sure. if you're healing by yourself. Does that make sense? Well, I think it depends on where is the trauma, what is the trauma, and where are you holding the trauma? Because when I think of trauma, I don't just think in the mind. I think whole body. Oh, yeah. Right, and so like a lot of the work that I do um, with caregivers to just like understand kids and trauma, but this is the same for adults, is like not only did the traumatic event happen to the mind, but it happened to the body. And so we have to use some of the like somatic kind of experiencing to understand like how our body rewired itself because of this trauma. What is somatic? So it's basically like, you know, you guys, it's like a buzzword now, somatic yoga. Um, I've never heard it. Okay. So it's, it's how it's different body movements to be able to release areas of trauma. And so like you try to identify like, um, and there's all kinds of different ways to do it, but it, it's primarily just trying to understand where in your body is this trauma being held and then like what is the best way to release that. So some people um, have morning rituals where they go out, they stand into the sun for, you know, five minutes, allow kind of like that to soak in. They might do full body shaking. Some people do integrative dance. Some people do yoga. Um, some people do myofascial release therapy. Mm. So like there's all kinds of different type of somatic approaches to it, but it really is body focused. And so where in your body is that trauma stored? One of my supporters just today sent me a book, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm, yes, that's one of my favorite ones. Is it? Mm-hmm, yeah. It, it, it's a heavy read. Oh, great. Thank you for the warning. Yeah, um, just because there's a lot of like neuroscience and science stuff in there. Wait, am I going to glaze over? Um, maybe on certain parts, but not all of it. Okay, so keep trucking. Keep trucking. Okay. Yeah. Because I think it will give you a lot of insight on kind of like how – trauma impacts not just the brain and I don't think that people really realize how much trauma impacts the development of the brain um, especially in your formative years so Mm. like if you experience trauma anytime before your brain is fully developed which is your mid-20s sometimes early 30s so that means um, trauma in regards to abuse neglect car accidents medical trauma addiction like all of that stuff will impact right? The way that your brain is developing and the way that you experience trauma, Mm -hmm. right? And so then it impacts also then the way that your chemistry and your body is different, right? I believe it. Yeah. And then it also develops like your belief system, right? So not, those are your thoughts and Mm. your emotions, right? So it's like, there's so many things about trauma that impact you. So divorce is just one piece of your trauma. Oh yeah. The divorce. Yeah. Right. For me personally, it's just things that led up to the divorce that changed me as a human being. Mm -hmm. I will never be the same. Um, I don't know how to be the same Mm -hmm. and it's for better and for worse. Like the person that I'm figuring out who the hell I am. Mm -hmm. I have no, I was just talking about this the other day on a podcast. I watch old videos of mine and I cringe. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not even me. Like that old version of me that everybody fell in love with. I'm not that person anymore and I never will be again. And I don't know how 
to be okay. Well, I don't know. I'm getting really deep into mm-hmm. it. But the point is, I feel like I'm like flipping through the universe mm-hmm. and I'm going to land mm-hmm. like in a really cool spot. I just don't know where it is yet. So I'm just flipping. I'm in flip mode. I'm flipping. There we go. But I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think the version of who you were wasn't your authentic self. It must not have been. Right. It could have been a trauma response. I think. To the whole marriage. Well, just to, I think in, I mean, we've talked about it before. Like you got into that relationship early in recovery where, and I don't know how it is for everything else, but Mm -hmm. in early recovery, like I started getting high when I was 13. Mm -hmm. I didn't get clean, clean until I was 30. You know what I mean? So I had to learn how to like be a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And in your early recovery journey, you got knocked up behind a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Okay. Every episode, we're going to bring it up? I just, when I get a chance, I have to. Okay. That's fine. Um, and so... I have questions. Yeah, that, <laughs> He's that, lying. That was... I, th- I just... I would think that it's just so interesting to me. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting that you watch that stuff and cringe. Oh, me. really? Yes. It's very, very interesting to me. Yeah. I feel like it's not even me. And so I'm wondering like what that, like what that could have been. I don't know. I could, I could reshare some of those videos and make so much money, but I'm too embarrassed mm. to reshare them. Cause I feel like that's not who I am anymore. I just want to be private. I want to wake up and go to a regular job and know what I'm doing. I don't feel like I'm excelling anywhere in my life. And I think that if I had a set place to go every day, like where I knew what I had to do, I could have a sense of accomplishment. But if I, if I don't know what the finish line is, I never feel a sense of accomplishment because it just keeps moving. Have you always been in content like creation? Has that always been? There? Not till 2018. Okay. And then it exploded before TikTok and stuff. It just exploded overnight. And suddenly like I was getting calls from MTV and the Today Show and they were flying me all over and like this whirlwind of fame. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. It's not, I mean, I'm, well, no, I just, I had no idea. That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. That makes me feel like we could really be friends in real life if you didn't know that. And I would like to be your friend. <laughs> not because I want to ask you questions. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I did like, I took a little bit of a deep dive before I came here today. So like, I knew that you had content creation, but I didn't realize like it was like, no, it was back in the day yeah. before TikTok. my videos, like Facebook videos mm-hmm. were it. And there was a small group of people doing it successfully. And I'm not trying to like brag or toot my own horn. Mm-hmm. Somehow I got sucked in at the perfect time to that algorithm. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I mean, millions and mil I think a billion views total on is what my videos have gotten like insane. And now I can't get four views. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Like I have to go back to Sonny's barbecue. Like I have to do something because. Oh, could you? We could get an employee discount. I would love yeah. to. I'm not joking. Like I'm living off. I've, I haven't said this out loud. And I don't know if I should, but I'm living off of all of the money that I made when I was touring, but I'm not bringing any money in because yeah. I don't f- know what to do. I'm frozen. Mm. That's a trauma response. I believe Dang. it. Mm-hmm. I believe it. Yeah. How do I, un- how do I thaw? Have you, have, um, I would suggest maybe looking into polyvagal theory. It's not an act. Have you heard of it? No, but it made me so hungry. Oh, <laughs> polyvagal theory yeah i don't know why it just makes me want bagels with cream cheese all right oh that does sound really good so um it's not like a modality of treatment or anything it's a theory um but you'll hear it mentioned in the body keeps score um i went to a symposium to two-day symposium last year with um, Dr. Stephen Borges, who is like the creator of the theory, and then Deb Dana, who is the therapist who has kind of taken the theory and put it into practice. Um, But it all is about kind of like distress tolerance and understanding that like when we have a trauma response, we have to actually work our way through Mm. that distress tolerance. We can't avoid it, Mm. right? But then understanding where your body is, right? And then how the vagus nerve is impacting all of that, right? When you are responding in that way i've heard of the vagus nerve Mm -hmm. yeah i go to a um, chiropractor who only does upper cervical care um because i was having a lot of like vertigo i was falling like all kinds of things and none of the doctors could tell me what was like going on and i've been going to him for um less than a year and i've like 
everything has decreased. I haven't had any falls. Like I still get a little bit of like tinnitus in my ear from time to time, but it's because of the pressure, just like my C1 and C2 were off by just a few centimeters putting on my vagus nerve. Wait, so I should go to the chiropractor? Well, I'm just saying it's just one version of the vagus nerve piece, but look into polyvagal theory. If if somebody, thank you. If somebody is dealing with unresolved trauma, Mm -hmm. and obviously each person is different, but I would think that it could cause, because the mind is a powerful thing, it could cause the body not to necessarily shut down. No, it can. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. So interesting. Yeah, so it's fight, flight, or freeze, right? I'm sure that's like the common thing that you guys hear, right, from the amygdala and the limbic system and the brain. Yeah, we talk about it all the time. Yeah, amygdalas. Yeah. yeah, well, there's a fourth one that they're starting to do some research on called fawning, which is basically like people-pleasing love bombing. Don't let, don't, don't. Those are two. <laughs> what do you think? No, he's just being dramatic. That's not even, what does it mean? What do you mean? So basically it's your, instead of like the fight, flight or freeze, the fawn response is that you are going to like be overly affectionate or overly do things with somebody to get their affection and get them to like a, want to be with you or like kind of this perceived like you're getting this perceived rejection so like you're going to try to like throw yourself into that right to make yourself not feel that way right mm-hmm. uh, that's t- tough and that, it's a survival response still yeah like so um <laughs> <laughs> i can't stand you dude. it's so interesting so, but the interesting thing about it is that when i was at the polyvagal symposium um Oh, I'm going to mess up. Oh, gosh. Um, the young girl who had been kidnapped for like Elizabeth years. Smart. The other one, J.C. Duggar. Dugard. Yeah. So her therapist was there. And they've started this whole um, like thing with equine therapy and polyvagal theory and kind of understanding how um, equine therapy can be helpful, which is horses. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and But they, they were basically saying that when she was in captivity, she was using – pretty much all of her fight, flight, or freeze fawn responses, like Mm. almost simultaneously, which is like that brain's, like your brain isn't wired to do that, but because she needed to make him think that, um, you know, that she was happy and fine, Mm. right? And, you know, she couldn't flee or fight or anything, right? Because if she did, we, you know, if you read her story, you know what would happen. So it's like she was, like all of those parts of her brain were activated all at like one time. Mm. Do you have to be a doctor to have a theory? Um, About what? Like to create your own like theory. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to be into research, so you have to be like, affiliated with a university. Like a scientist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean basically you, like a, a lot scientist. of time there's research assistants. Like, so like when you're in graduate school, you can be a research assistant and you basically like do the work for the doctor who is coming so up. The what if you're just work. a guy in a purple shirt who has a couple podcasts? Is yeah. that a thing? Sure. Yeah. Mm, I mean, you heard, you heard the clinician. What uh, theory do you think you have? Oh, well, we'll talk about it off air. All right, you don't want to give it away. Uh, no, no, it's top secret. Okay. Yeah. How's he going to make all of his money? That's true. Yeah. He has to trademark it first. Listen, I could literally go on asking questions forever. Yeah, me too. Forever. This has been amazing. Yeah, you've been like really it. great. Have you? Yeah. Do you do podcasts? Um, I've only done one other podcast. Um, it was like last year. They actually just released it like two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. I'm just kidding. Very, gonna... very weird timing. I didn't think they were going to release it. Um, but it was basically just on what I do for work. It was with um, a couple of foster parents who have a podcast, and we talked about how like parents can get connected to our services and stuff. And so, um, but no, I haven't done any. Other well, podcasts. I think you're a natural, really, yeah. and you're like informative and funny. And all right, so I'm going to look up poly bagel theory. Bagel, not bagel. Va- bagels. <laughs> Polly Bagel. Somebody get her bagel and cream cheese. Some, we're going to write it down. I'm going to look into yeah. it because I am I make a lot of jokes, but I'm messed up. <laughs> so here's my thing. Knowledge is power. I'm not saying diagnose yourself. I'm not saying do your own therapy. But I think going into a therapy relationship, having some knowledge about what you resonate with mm-hmm. helps you better than just going in and not having that. Because then basically they're going to be like, we're going to do this, this, and this. And you're like, this person's crazy. Mm. Somebody very close to me is convinced I have borderline personality disorder. Mm. And so as, just, should I walk in and be like, hey, check me for this? Or do are they like, stop Googling, that's annoying. Well, no, you can say like, somebody close to me has said this to me and like, I'm just curious, like, as we work together, 
I would like okay. to know your thoughts. Got it. Because right? it's not, so it's not a bad diagnosis. Like, yeah. I think that's the thing is like, one, I don't like labels. And I think I've already made it clear that the DSM is there to serve a purpose. But like, I just feel like people are people. Hmm. Um, people are messy. People are messy. And sometimes it's, but I don't think any diagnosis, I don't think borderline personality, like sociopathy, you know, narcissistic, you hear all these things. And yes. it's like, yes, somebody might have characteristics of those, but if they act on it, with malice and ill intent, right? So like somebody can be narcissistic and somebody can be a sociopath, but they could be in active treatment. Yeah. And not harming people. Okay, for right? sure. Because they have the awareness and the mindfulness that that's kind of their way of being and the way that they're interacting with other people. And they have to do the work not to engage in those maladaptive behaviors. Yes. So, like, so they're not a lost cause just because they just are. Because, yeah, just because you have that diagnosis doesn't mean that you're a lost cause. Right. I think a lot of it is just what are you going to do to make sure that as you live your life, you're living the best version of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel like getting wrapped up in labels is really easy mm -hmm. to do. I label myself all the time. I do too. I have no basis. Mm -hmm. I did not go to school, but I'm, I've done enough Googling of my symptoms that I feel like I'm an expert. I will say that'll take you down a real bad rabbit hole. It has. Yeah. I, I'm very messed up. But I also think on the other end of it. It's like, <laughs> no, but I want you to zoom in on your face when you said that because you actually, for a split second, actually looked messed up when you said it because you're like, I'm really messed up. I am. <laughs> I'm, and, and you know what? Maybe that's maybe there's something inside of me that just wants me to think I'm the biggest piece of shit in the world and like that voice is mm. just so loud. Because while I do think I'm messed up, I do think I've fucking survived a lot of really hard shit. Yeah. So excuse my mouth. And I do feel like I'm a badass boss ass bitch sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that mentally I have a lot of um, unresolved shit that I got to resolve. So yeah. I, I'm going to so, work on it. I would say, to me, it sounds like a belief system. Mm. Don't. Uh, like, you know what she's talking about. I do have a theory coming out, so. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Dr. Flip. <laughs> um, well, because when I, I think, and this is personal and professional, that how we're talked to as children and how that then resonates in other relationships and we allow people to talk to us throughout our lives the, the lies that we hear about ourselves from other people that we then make truth in our own mind cause us to have no self-worth or low self-worth and low self-esteem. And part of this is how do we start to combat those lies that other people have told us about ourselves with the truth of who we really are? Mm -hmm. Yes. How? You have to start challenging your belief system. Belief. So you have to, like those little voices that you hear... I mean, it kind of, it's different work for everybody, but like a lot of times I'll, t I'll coach people, write it down on a piece of paper. Like as soon as you hear it in your mind, like I'm a piece of shit, write it down. Okay. Look at it. Is that the truth? Mm. Right. What facts support that? And then write down what's the opposite of I'm a piece of shit. I'm an amazing boss ass bitch. What facts support that? I love it. Right. And so sometimes it's the visual. Sometimes it's saying out loud, going in the mirror and looking at yourself and saying, I'm a piece of shit. No, that doesn't sound right. Like that doesn't feel right. I'm a ba badass bitch. Yeah. You know, that sounds better. Like seeing it in the mirror and see saying it to yourself sometimes is I love it. Another way to do it. So I, I again, like I think a lot of belief system, right? And that like lack of self-worth, which comes from, you know, unhealthy or insecure attachment styles too, right? All of this stuff ties in together. Mm -hmm. So it's not just your brain, your biology, it's everything, your belief system, your brain, your biology. And then that all comes out in your behaviors too. So how you act out into the world. And that's the only thing that people see is our behavior. Like when I walk up to you, I don't know your history. I don't know your, you know, biology. I don't know your, like your belief system. I don't know anything about you, but your behavior is going to tell me something. It might not be who you really are, but underneath the surface is all this unhealed stuff. Mm. Dang. I feel like Flip's healed. No, I still got a lot of, I still got a lot of work to do. Nobody's healed. Yeah. I still got a lot of work to do. We should make this like a regular segment with you um, yeah and to get questions from the audience too yeah. very nice being here oh, it's, it's been, been great having oh you and God. we weren't prepared we're like we're not even gonna write any questions down we're just gonna wing it and then you got here and i uh, she teaches parenting classes like i didn't know any of this and i would so i think i'll be better prepared next time but i loved getting to just ask stuff that came off the top of my head i know i have so many questions yeah i, I do so too we'll have questions. to have you back if we yes. didn't scare you away no 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you have um like any websites or anything you want people to go visit? No. I, I mean, right now, the all the work I do is through the nonprofit that I work for. We all went to graduate school together. So me and my bosses all went to graduate school together. And they um, started this company back in 2015. Um, and I was a volunteer for them for a really long time. Um, and then I actually officially came to work for them, um, in 2019. Wow. And so that's what I've been doing. Um, I don't even know what graduate school is. Yep. So, uh, it's the, it's the school after your bachelor's degree that you have to go to if you want. It's to the be. school after the school. It's the school after the school. Oh my God. Yeah. I went to school for a total of eight years Ugh. after high school after high school and didn't you have to do a bunch of um like uh get supervised for a bunch of hours yeah or is that so my graduate school program i went part-time because i was working full-time so typically most people can get their master's in social work in two years i did it in four because your boss has been i had to work i didn't have the luxury of not working oh wait four is longer than two yeah, yeah. <laughs> shit <laughs> I was like, you go, girl, double time. (laughs) Um, But then after that, if you want to become licensed. (laughs) You have to do a ridiculous amount of hours. Yeah, you have to do two more years of clinical supervision with somebody else who's already licensed, who's a qualified supervisor. And then you have to pay that person. What? Because nobody really does it for free unless like you're working on an agency that has somebody that does it. But I didn't work at an agency that had somebody that did it. So I had to pay somebody privately. I became licensed. And so I've been licensed since 2017. And I just became a qualified supervisor for um, other So people now people seeking. can pay you. People could pay me. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Stop. So. Well, thank you so much. It has been uh, very informative. Mm-hmm. Um, my mind is blown. And we are definitely going to have to have you back because yeah. we still have questions. It's garbage night. Oh, okay. I was yeah. like, is that thunder? I wish. I know. I, know I don't know why it. I wish. I don't know what that even means. <laughs> <laughs> I just love storms so yeah. much. Go ahead. You you do it. No, you do it. Okay. Uh, make sure you check the links in the description. We've got our Instagram, our Facebook, our YouTube, our TikTok, which is popping, not to brag. <laughs> Um, follow us everywhere. Thank you so much for joining us yeah. and answering our questions. It's been fun. Yeah. It's been a blast. Yes. We love you guys and we'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>